Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Ben Fogel. And I'm Kate Humble. And you may be wondering why we're sitting here with a plate full of oysters. Well, sadly, they're not for Kate or me, but for two lucky safari park animals who are in the mood for love. More of that later, but here's what's coming up on today's programme. Why the head of Pet's Corner is taking a crash course in lion keeping. Okay. I put my foot down at lending a hand to feed the ostriches. Give a little bit of uh, cabbage in there. <laughs> I'm not sure I dare do that. <laughs> and I get a feel for life on the farm with the Safari Park vet. Do you like to have a go or? Um, I, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say can I. <laughs> But we're going to start down in Pet's Corner, where the meerkats from Southern Africa are one of the star attractions. Head of section Darren Beasley wants to make the exhibit even more of a crowd puller by ringing a few changes. We are actually in, uh, or on, Meerkat Mountain, and it looks like we've had a, a king-size mole, had a bit of a party here, and the fellas are, are trying to put it right. But in fact, what they're doing is really exciting. We've got a a new animal species going in here this year, um, and it's mixing with our meerkats. And what the chaps are doing at the moment is a bit of landscape gardening. So boat drivers, animal keepers, mud movers, um, jack of all trades, these guys. But what we're doing is we're trying to, trying to construct it a little bit better because the animals we've got going in here is very similar to a meerkat. We'll go inside and have a little look and I'll show you how well they're getting on and hopefully You'll be as excited as me. I love them. They're brilliant. Here we are. It's my, my new babies. These, they look like meerkats, but they're yellow mongoose. And if you can look, they've got bright yellow eyes and a big fox-like tail. And we have a pair in here, a male and a female. And they're having a right scuffle because they think I'm uh, going to feed them. Um, in the wild, these guys actually will share burrows with meerkats. They're ever so lazy. They wait for these poor little ground squirrel things to dig holes. Then the meerkats move in, and then these guys move in as well. And they eat lots of small, lots of small reptiles. Hey, 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 hey. Lots of small reptiles and uh, insects. I say they get, they're getting ever so excited and fighty now because what we've been doing is we've been trying to, to get them close to the meerkats to mix. And I've shut them in here because, if I can, I'm going to put the meerkats and the mongoose all in, all in together. We'll come back to see how they do get on when the mongooses have calmed down again. Longleat not only consists of the house and the safari park, but over 10,000 acres of woodland and working farms. And I've come down to Mill Farm to catch up with farmer Steve Crossman and safari park vet Duncan Williams. Hi, guys. Hi, Hi Ben. So what's going on today, then? Well, we're going to PD our cows today. What does uh, that mean? It's a pregnancy diagnosis. OK. And Duncan's come out to do that. Um, I got, I'm, I'm about halfway through my cabin, and it's, it's relatively unusual, but I'm running out of food right. rather quickly. Okay. And I just want to make sure that any of the cows, all the cows are in calf, any cows that aren't in calf, I can then get out uh, feeding on grass and uh, conserve uh. my food reserves. So how many cows do you have here? Um, we are, I'm running 100 at the moment, okay. and uh, we've calved about 30 right. up to now. And how many are you expecting to carve in total? Well, I'd like to carve 100, of course. But, uh, <laughs> of course. In, in an ideal world, but whether that'll happen or not, I'm not too sure. And Duncan, presumably that's one of the reasons you're here today, to help out with that diagnosis. That's right, yeah. We've got to manually examine internally every cow that Steve's worried about and uh, see if we can feel a calf or not. And obviously we often see you actually in the safari park looking after the lions. Um, or the tigers, but this presumably is the, the majority of your work on yeah, farms. Yeah, that's right. This is what I do most of the time. And the safari park really only takes up one, one day a week and any sort of extra calls that you know, they need us in there for. Most of the time I'm out and about on the farms around in the area. Now you're obviously dressed for a mucky job. How, does, how do you do this then? Well, this is um, not very nice for a cow. 
plenty of lubricant. Right. And literally, you're going to feel for a calf inside. That's right, yeah. We've just got to pop our hand inside. Um, and what are you feeling for, Duncan? I, I'm going to find the cow's uterus and then feel... This one's got a big calf in her. So I can feel the calf's head. Right. She's probably going to calve in about three weeks' time. Really? You can tell straight away just, just by feeling... Just from the size of a calf, yeah. yeah. Do you like to have a go, or...? Um, I've, uh, <laughs> I don't want to say, can I? <laughs> I don't know what Steve will think of me. Is that, I mean... No, I've got no objections. I've got no objections. Okay. Don't gonna, uh, don't gonna see you through. Plenty of lubricant then, and there's, okay, a, there's take, a glove, yeah. Take one of these gloves. Yeah. OK, you'll have to explain exactly what, um, what to feel for. So just put this on. OK. If you show me where I was, pull yep. her tail up with your left hand yep. and then gently ease your hand in. So you're going to pull on me? No, no. You sure? <laughs> Sorry, I'm not really. So just do what? What's yep, yep. Like that? That's right. And then you want to go in that way? Like that? Yeah, push it in there. OK. Go and push further. And keep going That's forward, it. keep going forward. Yep. You've got to go almost up to your elbow. OK. And what am I feeling? If you sort of pat your hand down, you might yep. feel the calf's head back now. I would imagine you're probably far enough in. Feel a solid love? I can. Yeah, there's a the calf's head. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. And you could tell, you could tell, you could tell from that the actual size. OK, there we go. Yeah, I just, it's, I mean, it's pretty rough, but I, I, I wouldn't be, I mean, wouldn't be too far out, I don't think, with that. The other way you can tell as well, she has got a bit of an udder developing there, yeah, so right. she's probably only about three or four weeks off anyway with that. And Steve, is it quite important for you to know um, how many to prepare for? I mean, I suppose, like you say, the food, the, f the amount of food you need. This time, yeah, I, I've, I've run, I run a bit short of food, so um, obviously if I can get uh, cows that aren't in calf uh, mm -hmm. out on the, uh, on the grass. And Duncan, when, when there's one not in calf, Duncan a, a check to make sure there's no problems with the ovaries. Some cows have cysts on their ovaries and other bits right. and pieces. And he can tell if there's an internal problem and whether it's worth keeping her on for another season or not. And What's your verdict then? It's that three weeks away, but you're yeah. happy that I mean, there's no. no well, other... she, she'll be fine. I think Steve will just keep her in and um, you know let her calf in the shed, like yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, Duncan, thank you very much for okay. um, for letting me try. I know you've got a lot of work to do because you've got to go through all of these um, these cows here, don't you? Yeah. Blimey, <laughs> I leave that to you. <laughs> thank you guys, <laughs> and um, and hopefully this cow will be a very I'll proud mum soon. I'll let you know when she calves. Please do. Right, Thanks, right. guys. We'll leave you to it. Cheers. Cheers. Then. Cheers. Back at Meerkat Mountain, Darren's about to find out whether the mongoose and meerkats will get on together. So, the mongoose now can come into the central one, which is this one, and it smells of meerkats, and the meerkats have been going in and out. These are our uh, meerkats here. Hi, guys. you got your new friends, and they have been seem to be getting on fairly well, so what I'm going to do is, a big moment, slide that up there and hope that the mongoose and the meerkats get on. Let's see what happens. I think one of the problems... Here we go, here we go, here we go. Hello. See the, the eyes, look, the bright eyes with those sort of horizontal slits. Oh, here we go, here we go. All right. Do you like them? Success. That's another result. No fighting there at all. Yellow mongooses and meerkats are closely related. Like the meerkat, the mongoose's natural habitat is scrubby woodland in southern Africa. And although they're famous for eating snakes, their usual diet is bugs and insects. Stu Cluley and Luke McGruther are worried that because meerkats and mongooses are natural burrowers, they may destroy all the work that's been done on their new enclosure. The meerkats and mongooses, they've never really been out here before as it's new meerkats and mongooses. Um, they'll run around. If there's any gaps between the wire mesh, you can guarantee they'll find it and they'll go in underneath. And then, of course, we've got to take all the mesh off to get them back out again. So we've got to, that's why we're doing what we're doing now, wiring it all together to link it all together. Darren's more concerned that the meerkats and mongooses may get out. We've got a couple of very small worries, and the one thing is how fast they move, the fact that they're, they're really wild, they can jump in the air like a, a leaping tiger, so I think we're going to have to figure out what we have to do with the enclosure and, and how they get on with the keepers and particularly the visitors. 
we don't want to lose the mongoose and we don't want visitors or keepers to lose fingers and things. So I think it's probably a really good idea when we let the mongoose out for the first day that we do it on my day off so I'm not here and I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> no, that's not true. I think we're going to have to be very careful. All new animals into a new exhibit are excited and they explore and find all the nooks and crannies and places to hide and they also try and find the places to get out. Um, but hopefully it's an entertaining enough area for them to live in. I think they won't want to go too far, but uh, we're going to have to have all hands on deck that day when we let these guys out, I think. We'll come back later to see if the mongooses do try to escape when they're let out for the first time. Set deep in the heart of the Wiltshire countryside, Longleat is one of the finest stately homes in Britain. It's been home to the Finn family since it was built in the 16th century, and Alexander Finn succeeded his father as Marquess of Bath in 1992. With 128 rooms and a surrounding estate of over 8,000 acres, it isn't a normal home by any standards. But what really sets Lord Bath apart from most homeowners is the safari park in his back garden, featuring over 400 different animals. It takes a small army of keepers to look after them all, and we've invited the seventh Marquis to get his hands dirty by helping them out. It's 8.30 in the morning, and keeper Becky Kendrick is arriving for work with her beloved white rhino as usual. What's different today is that she should have an extra helper, except the new boys having a lie-in. Hey, Becky, can we get up? I think I should get the office to give them a call. It's a bit late, isn't it? Good morning, Lord Bath. Good morning, Brad. Your breakfast. Many, many thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Not only, in fact, will I be meeting the rhinos for the first time, but this will be the first time I've met the people who are taking care of them. I'm a little bit nervous. I've, um, I've never met Lord Bath at all. So, you know, a little bit nervous about that. Should be fun, though. I think I'm looking forward to know what the feel of a rhinoceros rhinoceros is. It's a bit of a tongue twister. Well, I hope it'll be a finger twister too and I will be able to know what caressing a rhino feels like. The rhinos can get a little bit nervous of new people and, and Lord Buff, he's quite a, a larger than life character. So, you know, I'm a little bit worried they might freak out a little bit, but hopefully it should be cool. I believe that the horn is an aphrodisiac, I've always been told, but I don't suppose I'll get a chance of a nibble. Well, Booty, it's time we go. Up oh, here, this way. Go on. Hello, Ian. Ah, Lord Bath. Let's check your name in. Some kit I need, I believe. Yeah, you're going to do rhino today. So here's your uniform. OK. You need to put on. And we need to swipe you in, which is just outside the door. Oh, yes, you've got to swipe in, yes. Before right. You, otherwise, you won't get paid. Uh-huh. <laughs> Um, just got a, like that. Yeah, and swipe it slowly down. That's it, and you're in. Fine. Ready to start work. So, an hour after Becky began work, Lord Bath finally arrives on the shop floor. Hi, I'm Rebecca. And his first job? To clean us, of course. Come along, let's muck out. What would you rather do, sweep or pick up poo? And what? Just against the wall or what? Yeah. Fine. You're Go right. Um, and, and, and that needs to go there. Yep. I can pick that up with the shovel if you like. Well, it can't say it's out in the fresh air, but it's almost. Oh, yeah, you do it every day. You don't really, don't really notice you're doing it anymore. <laughs> now, I don't know you, um, if one gets rid of all of this. Brush it all yeah, with this. Oh, yeah, please. Thank you. Yeah, he's doing really well. He seems to be enjoying himself, so that's good. 
Yeah. Well, I've swept things before, and I don't suppose it makes much difference if it was a rhinoceros that did whatever I've got to sweep, or a dog, or a whatever. Not so nervous now, I've calmed down a little bit. <laughs> He's a nice gentleman, you know, very kind. This is an interesting beginning to the day. I don't know what's in store for me, but I shall approach it with interest and wait and see what happens. Having started at the bottom, Lord Bath's day can only improve. Despite shifting a hundred shovel loads of their dung, he's still keen to meet the residents, although he's a little wary of them. Are any of them ill-tempered, or they're all ch charming? He's a little bit moodier than mm -hmm. all of them, but, he, you know, they're new. They're not bad, so, for, as far as rhinos yeah, go. Yeah, for a wild rhino, they're pretty... He's getting there, we're just spending a bit of time with him, just sort of slowly patting him. Yeah. These, the two new females, they've settled in really well. We get quite a lot of contact with them. This one's Rosina. She's our, um, our youngest female. Right now? Yeah. Having survived his first ordeal, Lord Bart's looking forward to going out with Becky on Rhino Patrol. And of course, we'll be there to see how he gets on. This is Trevor. Until he arrived last year, the East Africa Reserve used to be a rather quiet place. Trevor is testosterone on two legs. Preening and posturing, he threatens anyone who gets too close or takes an interest in his part in Honey. Trevor is very interested in Honey, and they already have one son called Al. To help Honey to produce more little ostriches, the keepers supplement her diet. So Bev Evans is distracting the greedy camels. This is kind of what we'd like to call a dummy feed, really. Okay. Um, and what we're trying to do is keep the camels busy um, okay. while uh, Kate and Andy, who are down in the truck at the bottom, feed the ostrich their, their what, food. Is it literally because all the other animals want to go and grab the ostrich food? Yes, yeah, we do want to give the ostrich a bit of a chance, really, to be honest. Camels will eat anything, so, you know, don't always get into trouble, really. OK. So this is the food here, is this it? Is, yeah. So do we need to do some kind of bag rustling? Bag is that... rustling. We keep the camels oh, look, look, and things like camels, that. Camels! Camels! They're looking at <laughs> no. us, aren't they? When you start to put a bit on the ground, they'll, they'll come over. Will they? Yes. Are they, are they the greediest animals that they... live in here? Yes, most definitely. Because what else lives in here, then? Uh, we've got, obviously, we've got our camels, we've got our llamas, our zebra, yep. giraffe, and our ostrich. Shall I put it all out, do you um, think? Yeah, you can, I... do. That would be fine. And, um, and... What are the other animals like? Do you, do you like? Do you need to try and keep them away from the um, from the ostriches? It would be as well? nice if we could get the llamas over, but they have, seem to be quite interested in what's going on in the other truck at the moment. They're, they're frighteningly near. In <laughs> they fact. are. They might. Be... But this is this is the idea to, to attract these guys. Yes, keep the camels. And out. are there more? How many camels are out now? Uh, we, we've only got the, the three girls. It's here. just the three. Just the three girls: Valerie, Caroline, and Vera. Can you recognise each yes. each one? Yes. Which... Caroline, Valerie, and Vera. Is, is anyone in particular more greedy than the other? Uh, I would say Vera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely. And, um, and you do this every day, do you? We, when... we try to, yeah, try to keep you know, animals distracted while we try and feed the ostrich, yeah, definitely. Well, I think we have done the trick. I think Hopefully, the that will give um, <laughs> Kate and Andy some more time. OK, Kate, we're ready. Well, I'm here with head of section Andy Hayton, Honey, the female ostrich, and believe it or not, it's she who is the lucky one in getting oyster, which is bizarre. Oyster shell. Oyster shell. <laughs> oyster shell, shell right. yeah. For, for calcium for the diet to actually uh, help make the eggs. OK, so that is an oyster shell. No, this is actually like a pelleted diet. Right. Uh, especially for ostrich, and we yeah. give them a little bit of... Uh, want some? We give them a little bit of... Uh, brave. Cabbage in there. <laughs> I'm not sure I dare do that. <laughs> no teeth. Ow. Um, and we mix a bit of oyster shell in there as well for grit. So as you give chickens grit. So right. Let's it's, have a look it's at just it. good for so it. So it, it, it here. literally is. It's just ground up oyster shell, yeah. And I mean, does, does she does she notice it? Do you sort of mix it in with the other food we to kind of We mix it in with this feed, it? and and she'll just take it with her feed. And and this is when you say it's important for the shells. In what way? What what? Um, <laughs> it helps. <laughs> there you oh, are. Kate. Take it down there. <laughs> Don't be scared. Um, it helps create a, a good, healthy, thick shell for the eggs. Because of the calcium in because it? Because of the or... calcium in it, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. 
That's amazing. How did you discover that that was the right thing to do? Um, that was kind of like the feed that was advised, advised for, to, for ostrich. So yeah. I think a lot of people do it. Again, it's, it's the same kind of thing as giving, uh, giving chickens grit for a good digestion. Now, she's looking a little bit cross at me because this is one of her shells, isn't it? One of her yeah, eggs. Yeah, one of her eggs. Um, you've had a really successful breeding programme since Trevor arrived. Yeah, Trev's just the man. Um, <laughs> We've had we had 16 eggs that laid last year. Yeah. Um, three hatched. One chick was not very good right from the start because right. we had a really wet, horrible summer. Yeah. Um, and we had two hatch. One died after about three or four days after it hatched, and Al's still out here running around, running going strong. Around. And I mean, looking at this egg, this one's been blown, but it is it's it's like it's almost porcelain, porcelain isn't it? Yeah. It's like china. So presumably. This calcium supplement is vital to keep the egg, to, to, to get this form, to That's get right. this thickness of shell. Yeah. So are you hoping um, by all this sort of calcium feeding that you're going to have another successful brood this year? We hope to, yeah. We're taking the eggs at the moment because it's, it's, so, it's April, it's cold it's and too wet cold. and miserable. Yeah. And we kind of looked at it on, it, they're sit for 40 days and 40 nights. Really? Yeah, the female does all the sitting during the day. Yeah. Um, and the male does the evenings. But it, for them to sit for 40 days in, in this April weather. in this weather, we just sort of thought it, it's fairer on the birds if we don't do it. So we're taking the eggs away um, and blowing them. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll hope, hopefully they might lay a, another clutch later in the year when the weather's a bit more uh, clement for them. Absolutely. Um, and we'll go from there kind of thing. We'll, but, we'll, we'll keep our fingers yeah. crossed. Andy, thank you very much. Honey, this is no good to you, my love, but <laughs> get eating that calcium. We want more chicks later. Yes, please. <laughs> The Safari Park is home to 40 different species of animals from all corners of the globe. Over 35 dedicated staff work full-time to simulate their natural diet and environment. But hardly any of the keepers have seen the animals they care for in the wild. Hello, girls. Now, through Longleat's association with conservation charities, Head Warden Keith Harris has the opportunity to send four of his longest-serving keepers out to Africa. We've got involved in a charity called Tusk, who do a lot of work in particularly East Africa. Everything from translocating rhinos to collaring lions to, to monitor the lion um, population. It's also given us a chance to, with, our, with our, some of our keepers, to actually take them over there and give them a chance to see some of these animals in the wild. Head of Pets Corner, Darren Beasley, has been working here for over 18 years and he can't wait for the big day to arrive. I wouldn't tell any of the folks here, but I am like a big kid. I am so excited. Uh, I've been on the old internet at home. I've been looking up some of the animals that, we're, that live in Kenya that we're likely to see. Um, I've been doing my homework. Um, and, and generally, be it a lion or a, a scorpion or a, I don't know, a weaver bird, I think I'm just going to be chuffed. I'm just excited to go and really looking forward to it. For head of the giraffery, Andy Hayton, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. People go to Kenya every year on safari, but they're not getting what we're getting. You know, we're being paid to go out there, go on safari and go behind the scenes. You know, this isn't going to be... You know, a leopard appears and 12 minibuses all fire up around it. This is going to be out there actually working and, and seeing what's going on. So it really is an amazing opportunity to be allowed to go out there and do this. For all the keepers, it's the prospect of getting close to animals in the wild that they're most looking forward to. But these animals are truly wild and highly dangerous something that the head of lake animals, Mark Ty, is acutely aware of. We've always been used to sort of having the animals here contained and you sort of know where you stand with them, but to be out actually in the wild with animals that you don't know is probably going to be, probably at times, probably quite um, nervous, nerve-wracking, I should think. Each of the keepers has a particular animal that they want to see. And I know it sounds really silly because I work at Longleat Safari Park, the, the lions of Longleat, um, but I'm really quite interested in seeing the lions. Cape buffalo, I really like Cape buffalo. They're just big and dangerous and crackers. Flamingos don't do a great deal. Um, they either stand around sleeping or they're eating. 
Um, but I'm just hoping to see, obviously, greater numbers. The head of the new area, Tim Yeo, has been to Africa before, but he's just as excited as the others. Any trip, particularly one like this, where we're actually um, watching wildlife or hopefully, hopefully uh, um, helping with uh, some wildlife capture, uh, you know, is, well, it's, it's just such an adventure. As well as witnessing Tusk's conservation work at first hand, the keepers will also get to meet some of the locals. One of the biggest things is we, we, we never stop learning. So to be able to go over there, just even to see their natural diets and the type of things that even rhinos go and play with, you know, it might be an old tree stump, but it, it gives you all these ideas. It's just a wonderful opportunity to see them in the wild state and, and hopefully um, learn from that. I think you always do. I really think that each one of us are going for our own reasons. It really means a lot to me that I can relate to my staff when I get back, all my team here. I can actually tell them, hey, this is how it really is. You know, this is not, not how we think it is in books. This is how it really is. I'm up at Pets Corner with keeper Holly Needham and two of Longleat's newest residents here at Pets Corner. They are adorable, yeah. Holly. What are they? These are called Richardson's Ground Squirrels. Um, yeah. That one over there, that's Sandy. Yeah. We've got Steve here and we've got Cindy in here as well somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult to yeah, see Yeah, there them. she is. Oh, there she is up there. Yeah. Oh, they're fantastic. And they, they don't look very squirrely, though. No, they, they don't. They're actually related. They're from the prairie dog family. Right. Uh, meerkats, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so they're not, they don't really look so much like our squirrels. And, and where would you find them in the wild? You'd find them in the northern USA, Canadian border, around okay. there, in the prairie deserts, basically. So prairie deserts sounds like they don't live in trees? They don't, no. They live underground in their, they're called chambers, they're basically burrows. But right. They, all have, they live in big groups, but they all have their own separate chamber, if you So like. they all have an individual bedroom? That's right, yeah. Lucky yeah. things, they're amazing. So um, when, when you bring something new into pet's corner um, what what sort of things do you need to do to kind of make sure that they've got an environment where they're happy and relaxed you just basically need to make it as natural to their environment as you like like in, inside their house they've got their own digging area where they can make their own nests right um, as long as they've got their the same sort of foods that they'd eat out in the wild yeah. and things you you're know. clutching dandelions yeah there. did you do want to give them yeah some? can yeah. I well, they, they oh, do like their much. dandelions yeah um, and what, what else would they eat? Do you think they'll um, take it from they, them? they have their dried food, um, lots of seeds, things like sunflower seeds, flaked maize, oats. Yeah. Um, we do give them the odd insect every now and then as right. well. They, they do enjoy a, a locust. And, and these tubs in here, um, mm. I was going to say they can't yeah. be the decorations because no. they don't look very pretty. No, they don't look pretty. No, they've been a bit naughty actually. We've been sort of trying to make it look like the prairies with like cactus plants. Right. Um, but they've been getting in and digging. Um, <laughs> and making burrows yeah, making, in the, in the making a lot of mess. And I'm just noticing up above them, yeah, you've got we've got the chipmunks. Yeah, the chipmunks. Yeah, they come down. This is their feeding platform. They come down here and then they feed off the food that we put in there for them. And it? and do I mean are they related? They look quite similar. No, no, they're totally not, different. No, totally different families. Yeah. But don't seem to mind. No, they don't mind being in, in close yeah. proximity. They are. Oh, these are so sweet, Holly. I bet the public are loving they do. them. Aren't they do. They they adore them. Yeah. And I think you do too. Yeah, they're my favourite. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you very much. That's for introducing okay, me no to problem. them. You are enchanting. Do you want more dandelion? There you are, madam. Ooh. Head of section Darren Beasley needs to complete the changes at Meerkat Mountain before he can head off to Africa. The golden mongooses are about to be released for the first time and Darren's taking precautions just in case they try to escape. Guys, what we're going to do is we've got the three strands of electric fence which is on the lowest tickle zap. The worst thing is he might leap up on the fence and try and scale here. Um, if you think he's coming towards you, you've got to do your, your idiot impression. Okay. I was like, just <laughs> wave your arms or clap, make a noise, OK? Um, right. Just really trying to turn him back. 
And last but not least, I got my wiggly me <laughs> mealworms. <laughs> and the idea is to scatter a bit of food down here, literally here, just to try and keep them digging this area and, and see if they can uh, not explore too far on the first day. We just want them to take it easy on the first day. I think they're a bit braver uh, than the meerkats, which we will have to watch out for and just generally exploring, which is exactly what we want, looking for food. The mongoose became a famous animal when Rudyard Kipling wrote his Jungle Book story about Ricky Tiki Tavi, who killed a family of cobras to save a boy's life. They won't find any snakes here, but that won't stop them from looking. I mean, they're just exploring the little bit that's around here. They don't seem to be too worried about shooting in a straight line anywhere. And do you like the way we threw the peacock in just to add turmoil to the equation, you know? Um, and that panicked them a little bit, but they didn't run up the, the walls. Generally, they're doing what we want them to do, you know? They're, they're doing their normal behaviour. They're ferreting around looking for food, or mongoosing around looking for food, I should say. So far, so good then. But assuming that all the animals do settle in, Darren still wants to make further changes. We're going to have to give this uh, heavily monitoring over the next few days, presuming the mongoose don't wander, because I can't spare my guards around the edge all day, every day, but presume they've got, they create their own natural barriers. I think the next stage for us is to, to bring a new male uh, meerkat in um, and hopefully add that into the, the melting pot and see what happens. And, and I'm hoping, really, you know, it should be this nice balance and they should all just keep getting on and the mongoose should, should love it in here as much as the meerkats do, really. I'm down at Pets Corner with keeper Joe Hawthorne and we've come to check up on Caliph the Python. Is that right? <laughs> That's right, yeah. He's a royal python. And, um, and you're just checking on his skin, is that right? Yeah, um, well, basically, they, they shed skin um, to grow, so they have to grow out of their old skin. So mm -hmm. what they do is um, it's, it's called sloughing. Mm -hmm. So as they're growing, obviously, they've got to get rid of their old skin. They either come out in one big, long go, or they'll shed bits of skin along the body, piece at a time, a bit like you and me when we've been out in the sun for too long and <laughs> start peeling. <laughs> but um, the first sign you can tell by that is if you look at Caleb's eyes here, yeah. they're really black and bright and shiny. Yes. Um, when they start coming across all kind of milky and cloudy, that's when they're about to, to shed. OK. So you need to leave them alone then. And what does the skin look like when they have sloughed? Um, I stuff? have some here, actually. There you go. Yeah, it's just wow. like a bubble wrap. Blimey. It's so very soft, isn't it, it actually? Is. And yeah. And it comes off in one long... It does. Usually, like I mean, it, it very all depends on each particular snake, but usually, yeah, they'll kind of just come out in one big long hit um, and they shed everything, even, even the uh, coverings on their eyes. And how long would it take them to lose that entire skin? Um, in, in one go like that, probably within a couple of hours, it'll all be kind of gone. Right. Yeah. That it's amazing. quite amazing to see. Mm. Does, it, do they, does it exert a lot of energy for them? It to, does, to yes. Hence why you know, they have to prepare themselves um, before they have to do it. And then after, of course, they feel very vulnerable because they've got this brand new skin underneath. And, you know, you imagine it's, it's quite a kind of stressful thing to do. So. Wow. Mm. Well, Joe, thank you very much That's all right. for um, enlightening me about that. <laughs> well, there's plenty more fascinating things still coming on today's programme, including... The keepers may see lion cubs in Africa, but they'd better watch out for mum... You need to be quite brave up here or bomb-proof. Big, grey and friendly, Lord Bath's been bonding with his rhinos. Never when I pass again will I think of it in quite the sort of same inanimate shape as I had thought of rhinoceri before. Now it is a rhinoceros that knows me. And when it comes to cute and cuddly, tiny tapirs are hard to beat. This is Ernest. Oh, look at him. He's our new lad. Look really they nice do, they look like little humbugs, yeah. don't they? Really, like really sweet. As head of Pets Corner, Darren Beasley usually works with Longleat's smallest, cutest and most harmless creatures. But when he's out in Africa with the other keepers, most of the animals he's likely to come across will be a lot bigger and more dangerous than the ones he's used to here. I'm a bit concerned because I've never been on safari before. I mean, I work with the small animals down here. The only time I ever get to see a lion is when I'm picking tortoise food in the summer and Bob or Brian are stood there with a, a big gun over my shoulder and, and then my head's down, I'm working so fast I ain't got time to see the lions. 
I think these animals out there are more wild. We'll hear them before we see them, I think. Also, Darren hopes. But to prepare himself for the ordeal ahead, he's asked big cat keeper Bob Trollope if he can spend some time with Longleat's lions. Hi, Bob. Hi, Darren. How you doing? I'm not so bad, mate. I understand you want to help feed the lions today. <laughs> I wouldn't mind having a go. Yeah, I think I'd better see the, the thing before I go off and see them in Africa. Right. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, just got a couple of pieces to put on and then we're ready to go. Right. Brilliant. OK. Oh, that's good. They just go on this side here. Goodness, they eat all this. Yeah, they will do. That's on a small feed, really. Um, we'll have to do a quick safety talk. Right. Um, most important, when you're up in here, you just get a little bit wobbly, yeah. Right. If you feel like you're going to fall over, try and grab one of the handrails right, and okay. not the mesh, because obviously there's going to be some snappy little things outside that would love to take their fingers off. Right. Another important thing, in the event that we tip over, which is pretty unlikely, um, that is the most important thing to shut this chute here. Um, so, we're ready? They, ready? they chase this, they'll chase this. Hopefully, yeah. Some of the older and wiser ones will cut corners and wait for it, but right, okay. uh, yes, they should chase it. The cage is locked and there's no going back now. The first of the two prides that Darren's going to have to deal with is led by the big male, Mafui, and there's no question that they're hungry. These are all females in, because he's got the he's got the mane. Yeah, you might not see many males over there with such a big mane as uh, Mafui. Uh, obviously, being hotter temperatures, they might not need so much. And do they have a bit like the wolves? Do they have like a pecking order of who eats dinner first? You know, do they? Is it always the girls catch it? In the well, uh, longly, we that's why we cut them up into small chunks because the male will grab right. the best spot which is natural you know you would okay. get there the women do all the work and then the, the males go in there and get the feast <laughs> i've got one eye they're so big bob <laughs> i don't know so... do you want to start checking some of this out just drop it down the hole yeah, yeah. um basically you know, within the females you have a pecking order this one here diana she's a very dominant animal right and she will chastise any younger ones and some of the older ones as well if she thinks they're in the wrong for some reason we, we feed these about three or four times a week. It's very dependent. We don't feed them every day because they wouldn't hunt every day in the wild. They wouldn't, well, they might try and hunt, but they wouldn't necessarily get a kill every time. If you actually see a kill taking place, then that's going to be wonderful. Um, you most probably see them let down fast asleep, which they do so well. Okay. They can spend up to 20 hours a day just sleeping. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, 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 I'm going to come back as a lion. <laughs> well, do a job if you can get it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, goodness. <laughs> oh, you came at the bars then, you see that? You know, we, we are reasonably safe in this cage. The feed truck is solidly built, but in fact, one metal grill is all that stops the lions from helping themselves to some really fresh meat. The keepers. No, I feel quite safe in, in the cage, and I know Bob knows his animals, and they're getting meat. I mean, look at that, they'd rather eat this than me, I'm sure they would. But, um, <laughs> It's just the size, actually, to be honest. I'm quite excited. I mean, I don't know if I want to get this close to, to wild lions. <laughs> it's dangerous enough in here, but uh, so we're in a cage, but I don't want to get too close to wild lions. I've taken a good pair of binoculars. I intend to look from a distance. <laughs> the adults in a pride always feed first, but Mafui fathered two cubs a few months ago. We'll catch up with Darren when he meets them and their mum later on. Longleat House is often called the Treasure House of the West because of its fascinating collection of paintings and antiques. But to try and fascinate pint-sized visitors too, curator Kate Harris has come up with a novel idea, a quest. So Kate, how does this actually work? This is a new competition for this year. We had one last year that made children look at the portrait collection. Mm -hmm. This one is aimed at making them look at absolutely everything in the house, at the furniture, the ceilings, the wallpaper, the paintings, the tapestries, and find living creatures. Okay. Or creatures that once lived, so extinct <coughs> things are allowed, or even mythical creatures are allowed, so monsters are allowed. So is this, this it, is yeah. one of the... This is one of the forms that they have to fill in. So you in. divide it up into the different rooms. Yeah, so um, we're in... We're in the anti-library. The anti-library, so... 
and target. we tell them they've got to find a certain number in each room. The target for this room is three. So basically, they have to come in here and find three animals somewhere. Yeah, three liberties hidden. of any kind. Could yeah. it be hidden anywhere? Yeah. Blimey. Anywhere at all. <gasps> this is, and it's to get them to look closer, it's like to get I am. Them to I look for now. themselves and discover for themselves. So it's much more positive. It gets them to engage with what they're looking at. I have to say, I'm not doing very well. Can you, can well, you give me any hint? Well, hint, look at the table. Table. Table, table, table. Snakes! Yes, you're, <laughs> you're allowed them. Is that, is that a snake or is that a... a it's a very scary looking snake. Yes, yeah, I put a snake down. OK, I'll put that on the board. And, um, and I suppose, you know, they look closer at it and just yes. appreciate it yes. more. So where, where is this from? That's from North Italy and it's um, later 18th century. Wow, it's very, um, very ornate, isn't it? Yeah, stunning. The, the serpents twine round the table and round, round the front legs of the chairs. Oh, so they do. Gosh. Yeah. OK, I know roughly what to look for now. Oh. Anything, anything? Paintings, nothing on the paintings. How about that? They're probably going to have trouble identifying this creature. The back half is a lion, but the front is an eagle. Oh. An eagle with ears you'll see on the head, and that's called a griffin. A griffin. So they'd be allowed that because it's a, a monster, a mythical beast. And I suppose they, 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 they really like their... I, mean, I certainly yes. remember as I was younger, I yeah, loved Yeah, I think even dragons. more so now because they're so interested in the Harry Potter books, which of course. are full of monsters, full of, of monsters. Of course, so that's kind of tapping in on that enthusiasm, I yes. suppose. So have you had any people try out this competition yet? Yes, I tried out the first draft on my younger son, and he mm -hmm. had a lot of trouble with this piece. This one here? Yes. The people? He... Oh, no, the fish the underneath. Fish. You see, he wouldn't accept that those were dolphins, because they're not really like... <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know that I'd accept those No, dolphins, they're not like Kate. the ones he's seen on television, so he was very <laughs> hesitant about writing down dolphins. It's not exactly flipper, is it, with those big teeth no, sticking out like that? No, not quite the same. OK, dolphin, if I'm allowed to yes. add that, even yes. though you helped me with it. <laughs> so has the competition actually started yet? No, it hasn't quite started. This morning what we're doing is testing it out, testing the final draft on some children from our local primary school who've kindly volunteered to be guinea pigs for the morning and they're beavering away through here if you want to join them. <laughs> that sounds like a challenge to me. Yes. Well, join us later when I pit myself against the local primary school. Come on, then. To prepare for his forthcoming trip to Africa, head of Pets Corner Darren Beasley has been out in the feed truck, so he's been quite close to the big cats. But now, Keeper Bob Trollop is leading him right into the lion's den. Oh my goodness. Oh, jeez. Even at that age, they will give you a nasty bite. They're snarling already, though. Perhaps you ought to practice going in there and catching them. Perhaps I shouldn't. <laughs> Start on the little ones and then go for the big ones. Even at this age, they'd be chomping into this in no time. Yeah, mate. OK. Whoa. All right, darling. OK. Hey, hey, hey. Who's that? This is Sazzy. That's the mum of the two cubs. She's a young female. She's about three and a half years old. First, first litter, so Brilliant. she's doing really well. I know I keep saying it, but they're so huge, the size of her head. Do you think something that little will grow up to something this big and equally as ferocious? Incredible. That's incredible. That noise, I mean, I hear that down the bottom in, near Pet's Corner. I mean, that, that roar can, can carry it miles. It, it? Yeah, yeah. On a, on a still night, you would hear that most probably three or four miles away. So we could probably hear them when yeah. we can't even see them. Yeah. And even at this age, these, these youngsters will be learning from mum. Right. All our animals do that as well, you know. It, it might be a, a rabbit or a baby meerkat or it can be anything, but, the, the, you know, the, this parental thing is so important. They learn from, from watching and, you know, every day is an experience. Every, every, everything's a new smell. Um, the only difference is <laughs> I'm not likely to lose my life to a, a, rab <laughs> a rabbit. You need to be quite brave up here or bomb-proof. Darren stared into the jaws of death, but it's actually whetted his appetite for more. I'm really looking forward to seeing lions in the wild. I think the only, the only thing I, I believe is I'm never ever going to get such a good view as this, you know, sat in the vehicle back there or in the back of the cage or here. Um, I, you can get incredibly close to these lions because um, of the safety precautions are put in place. But obviously, I imagine wild lions, we're going to see it at a great distance, you know, um, for safety. Um, I'm 36 years old and I've stood here and this is close as I've probably ever been to a lion. And I'll remember this. I'll remember this forever. And when I'm in Africa, 
I can relate some of this to, you know, well, this is how they, how they act in the wild. This baby's just climbing on. Mum's biting mum. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I hope to see some of this in Africa. I hope to see, you know, the males and the females. But I'm also hoping to see lots and lots of little animals. Um, I've been reading my books and looking to see what, what I might get to see. And it might be a dung beetle, but I'll be excited about that, you know. Um, so, but this is... This is fantastic, it really is fantastic. Darren's done all he can to prepare himself for the trip to Africa. The next time he sees lions, it will be out in the wild, just a few weeks from now. Well, I've come up to the tapir enclosure with head of section Andy Hayton to catch up on how they're doing. Andy, tell me all the latest news. Well, we've, uh, as you can see, it's a little bit muddy in here. So we've actually extended the paddock this year. Okay. It was the first year of them being in here last year. So right. we thought we'd given them enough ground. Yeah. But um, because of the way their, their feet are and everything and the mess they make, we've actually made it bigger to try and So are you saying better. that all this, which looks like a ploughed field, has been done by them? Yeah, just these really? guys. Really? Yeah, and we haven't had a particularly wet winter either. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they just they do make a, ever such a mess. But they, it's the way their feet are designed. Because they are, I mean, they're from... Wet areas, yeah. basically, aren't they? Yeah, rainforest. So what happens is when you see when they walk, their their feet really spread. Right. And then when they pull their feet back out, it's to stop them sinking too much. And when they pull their feet back out, they kind of close up. So it's, it's so, almost so, like a suction. So thing. they won't get stuck. But of course, here, where they're it's on the same patch of ground all the time, they just they really mess it up with the big big footprint that they make going in. Now I want to carry on on that, but new addition. Yeah, this is uh, this is Ernest. Oh, look at him! He's our new lad. He's wonderful. Still got his stripes. Still got his stripes. He loses stripes at about six months old. And why do they have these stripes? Because, you know, the adults are uh, just plain sort of grey-brown. Why do the it's, babies get them? It's for camouflage. Right. When, when mum will lay the baby up, what mum will do, she'll lay the baby up um, and, and leave it. And basically right. the baby will lay quiet and mum will come back and feed it when she sees fit. So she'll, it. it'll be hidden, what, in sort of rainforest leaves? Yeah, in, in, in leaf litter and, uh, you know, underneath a bush or whatever. So it's just good camouflage and they'll just stay silent and, and won't move and mum will go off and graze and whatever and then come back and feed the little one. How it's a shame, amazing. really, because they look, look really they nice. They do, they look stripes, like little humbugs, yeah. don't they? Really, like really sweet. So you say at about six months those stripes will They'll start fading, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, they, there'll be a few stripes, you know, spots left yeah. here and there, but uh, on, the, on the whole they'll disappear and it'll just turn the colour of mum and dad. So you've extended the enclosure, so they've now got all of this area, have they? <coughs> all this area up to the road, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jethro, <laughs> as usual, having a bit chilling. of a sit down. Can we go up and say hello <laughs> yeah, to him? Yeah, sure. Hey, Jethro. So yes, you can actually see really clearly, can't you? The sort of the grass that they haven't been yeah, on. Yeah, I mean, this is the the fence line that they were on is just you know really well defined mud. And, and they're going to get this for the rest of the summer. Right. And, I mean, is it, is it good for them? I mean, it's, it sounds sort of obvious, but is it good for them to have a bigger area, do you think, apart from just getting them off the mud? Yeah, it's nice where they've got a big area like this. I mean, they're, they're, obviously, they're not going to ruin the ground. There's going to be more grazing for them. Yeah. Um, and they can get away from each other. Yes. You know, that's a nice thing for them. If Jeffro wants to be at that end, Jesse wants to be at that end, they can do it, and there's, there's a lot of space. Are they quite solitary, then, in the wild? Uh, in the wild, they would be, yeah. yeah. More, more solitary than they are here. But, I mean, they rub along pretty good. Yeah. And they breed and, brilliantly. And I have to say, I absolutely love them. What are you doing down there, Jethro? Well, Andy, thank you very much. It's great to see them, and I hope you guys enjoy your new enclosure. He says, I don't care, I just want to sit here for a bit. <laughs> there we go. Back at the Rhino House, Lord Bath has been spending the day helping keeper Becky Kendrick. Babs, who's in her mid-thirties, and the three young ones are being let out for the day. But the two males can't go out together because they'd fight. It's Winston's turn to stay behind, and it's another chance for Lord Bath to get some hands-on experience. We'll just give him a dry scrub first of all. Mm -hmm. Normally we'd give him a bit of a wash. Right. But he's pretty friendly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We just like the contact, really. He's our older bull. We've got a new bull. And obviously we can't mix the two bulls. Uh -huh. We're trying to mix him with the females, but we tried a little while ago and it wasn't very successful. Because, I mean, he could really hurt the new rhinos. Yes. We want to be such huge... In the wild, animals. there would only ever be the one bull, so this is yeah, a it's no difficult need situation. To, yeah. But the young bull, for the moment, the one who's more nervous, or he's nervous of the young bull? 
He's, he's more aggressive towards the young bull because yeah. it's, it's a new bull yes. in his territory, it's, it's understand. But the little bull, he's, and, he's not really old enough yet to be too worried about it. So yes. he's just <laughs> sort of, he's not really too sure. But like I say, Winston's so huge that if he did want to hurt them, he could really, really hurt them. With Winston settled in the rhino house, Becky takes Lord Bath up to the paddock to show him the ropes on rhino patrol. What, Ibis or what? Oryx. Oryx. Our job really is to either stop them from possibly charging a car. Yeah. Or, you know, they might start fighting and then we've got to get in there and <laughs> split it up. This is us for the day now, so we patrol here. Normally, obviously, we do it in a tractor. So we've got the bash plate on the front of the tractor, so if the rhinos really mess around, you know, you can <laughs> sort it out. The rhinos usually just munch grass peacefully, but they can be a real handful, requiring all the keeper's tractor-driving skills to keep them under control. The rhinos are so quick. They're are they? really, yeah, really, really fast. When we push them in at night, they run down, and we can't keep up with them in the tractor. <laughs> They're doing over 30 miles an hour. So they like, prefer being inside their hut than out here, then? Oh, no, they love it out here. Love it out here. After all the mucking out and cleaning, it's a pleasure just to sit and watch them for a while before heading back to the rhino house for a well-earned cup of tea. Ready, Tate? So have you enjoyed your day then, Lord Yes, it's had most interesting yeah. seeing them so up close. It's a different, isn't it? Different, so, I, mean, I see them more from a distance frequently, but up close, eyeball yeah. to eyeball, no. Went really well. Yeah, it was, um, it was good fun. I think Lord Bath enjoyed it. Um, we did a bit of patrolling, um, scrubbed Winston, which was good. Well, I did like being able to caress the rhinoceros. I never, when I pass again, will I think of it in quite the sort of same inanimate uh, shape as I had thought of rhinoceri before, but now it is a rhinoceros that knows me. <laughs> he, was, he was really good around all the rhinos. Um, the rhinos took to him quite nicely, and we didn't have any problems, no aggression. Um, no, it was good. He is just a nice man. He's, he's not a big scary man that I thought he was. He's just a genuine guy. <laughs> I'm in Longleat's Red Library with house archivist and curator Kate Harris, and we've been working our way around the house's new competition where you've got to find as many animals as you can hidden in each room. And I've come for some expert advice from two of the pupils from Horningsham School. Hello, girls. How are you? We're fine. So what's your name? Anita. Anita and... Harriet. So how have you done in this room? How many, who, how many animals have you spotted so far? Um, I think 13. Ooh, can you read out some of the ones you found? Griffinish, phoenixish, hippogriffish, <laughs> dragonish, <laughs> mythical creature. Yeah, that's it. That was it. Excellent. Well done. So can you point out, I, I have to say I've been hopeless so far and Kate's been helping me, so can you point out some of the things that you've spotted in this room? Well, I found the fireplace. The fireplace? What's in there? The lion and the reindeer and the stag. Of course. So, Kate, what's, what's the significance of this? And he's just found the fire back, which commemorated the quarter centenary of the house in um, 1980, and it shows the family's arms. So the lion's a special one. It's the Scottish lion with a knot in its tail. That's the, given to Sir John Thin as his coat of arms after the Battle of Pinkie in 1547, when the English defeated the Scots, so they put a knot in the Scots <laughs> lion's tail. Wow, so really, there's so much history behind all of these. Yes. What, el what else have you found? Have you found anything? Um, I spotted the two children there with the dog and the rabbit. They're upside down. Maybe. Up on the ceiling? Yeah. Blimey, how long did it take you to, to spot that? Not too long. Not too long. I think you've both got your eyes peeled for as many animals as you, you could find. Are you enjoying it, then? Yeah. yeah. Is yes, it yes. really fun? Yeah. yeah. Had you ever looked yeah. this closely at the house before? No. no. <laughs> Wow. Some rooms I didn't in the middle one. I bet I've spotted an animal that you haven't spotted. A griffin? Ah, you beat me to it. Did you put that on your list? No. Oh, see, I'm going to put that on mine now. 
You are very good. Well, Kate, it obviously seems like a great success if um, if these two girls are anything to go by. Do you think you can help me with um with the next room because I'm not doing very well still? Yeah. Let's catch up with the well, others. Better leave us to it. Doing. Come on, girls. Right. What was it? A griffin, a hippodragonish no, sort of a thing. To the next one. The keepers who are going out to Africa will see many of the creatures they look after here in the wild, but they won't see any wallabies because they don't live there. But Andy Hayton has seen too many here anyway, and Mick is partly to blame. Now I gather that he is one of the fathers of most of the joeys that we would see at the moment. Yeah, um, we took the decision to, to just keep two entire males in here and, and castrate the rest of the males because we were having kind of a 50-50 um, male and female births and we just had too many males in here, the males were fighting, so it's the best way to manage them is, is, is to castrate and just keep two males for the breeding. Um, we actually kept Mick because he's a really, as you can see, quite a quiet male. Um, and if we can sort of, and he was quiet, he just came up to us last year and started being nice and taking food off. He us, probably so. heard what you were up to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, so, yeah, we decided to keep him because he's just obviously a friendly male and if, if that can carry on down, and we want friendly animals in here so the visitors can, can see them closer. Absolutely. And do they breed throughout the year? You mainly get the joeys in spring, sort of this time of year, um, but they can actually have a joey coming in and out of the pouch um, like a little pinky attached to a tea and be pregnant as well. So, wow. so yeah. it's a complete sort of cyclical motion that all year round. Just they constantly sort of on the go, yeah. For baby machines. That sounds absolutely exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy, thank you very much okay. indeed. That sadly is all we've got time for today, but here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. I'm tracking rhino with the keepers in Kenya, but who's hunting who? Oh my god. You may wriggle at the idea, pet owners, but you simply have to trim his teeth. They'll grow and grow and grow, and they can actually grow up into their own brain and actually kill them, no. so... And there's certainly more bounce to the ounce with this African baby. So really it's frisky like a little dog, I mean, yeah, jumping up and down and things. <laughs> it's just a little bit heavier. That's all coming up in the next Animal Park. <laughs>